Okay. Well, welcome everyone to our, I guess this is our third, right? Our third uh, monthly catechetical talk. Um, last month we talked about Orthodoxy and Catholicism. Um, and as of the time I'm giving this, that talk is not yet online if you missed it. Uh, I still need to edit it. So by the time this talk is online, if someone's watching online, that one should be up now. So there should be an Orthodoxy and Catholicism talk and then today's, which is Orthodoxy and Protestantism. Now, the problem we had with the talk on Catholicism is compounded here. And that, that problem was Catholicism is really actually quite varied. There's a, there's a lot of variety today, and uh, it forces us that when we talk about it, we have to be rather overgeneralized in some things. Well, Protestantism lies on an even greater spectrum with areas of belief and practice ranging from being fairly unified in some areas to being almost, you know, having no recognition between one denomination and, and the next. And so, just as with the talk of Catholicism, I, I, I have to, by necessity, overgeneralize a lot of what we're going to talk about today. Also, though, just like with the talk on Catholicism, I really want to start with a focus on some positive, positive things about modern-day Protestantism uh, before getting into the differences and some of the, the criticisms that we would have. And really, there are two main areas that we can focus on here. Uh, you know, as an Orthodox Christian, just generally, it's, it's really not a helpful approach to look purely negatively at things and criticize them. I, I've said this many times for catechumens that when you look at your past, whether that's Protestant, Catholic, LDS, Atheist, you know, whatever it is, you can't look with a purely negative eye. It's really not healthy for you. What you ought to do is actually look at the truth that you did have and view that as a stepping stone and thank God for the truths that were there. So my family, coming from Lutheranism, can look at Lutheranism and say, Glory to God, there were a lot of truths there that helped lead us into orthodoxy. Had we not had Lutheranism, we might, might not have become orthodox at all. And so that's a healthier way of looking at it, which is why we're going to start with these positives. So in the case of Protestantism, there's two places that I think we can really uh, pull out uh, as, as orthodox Christians a, a very positive outlook and actually learn from Protestants. There's probably many more other, there are many other areas, but there's two in particular that I think we, we ought to take the most from. The first is the extreme dedication in Protestantism to the reading and studying of the scriptures. And the second is the great fervor for evangelism, for sharing the faith. So, I know many Orthodox who shy away from these things because they fear looking or acting too Protestant in their approach. But that's really not the option we want to take. We don't want to look at these things and say, well, that's too Protestant, I don't want to do that. What we should do is say, my goodness, there's actually really good things in here that have a tradition within the Orthodox history. These things are based in Orthodoxy. And what I want to do is approach these with as much fervor as Protestants, but do it in a more Orthodox way. So for instance, daily scripture reading. Daily scripture reading ought to be the mark of an Orthodox Christian's life. And we could say the same as boldness in sharing our faith. These two things ought to be part of our Orthodox life. We ought to be making sure that we're engaging with the scriptures daily, and that we're, we're freely sharing our faith with those around us. We want to make sure that, in some ways, we Orthodox, because we believe the Bible is a book of the Church, and for the Church, ought to be engaging in the Bible even more than the Protestants. You know, the, 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 we tend to think of the services of the church as having just, oh, there's just one little part for the epistle, there's one little part for the gospel. You can look online at a uh, PDF you can find uh, concerning the divine liturgy and the scriptures, and it goes into depth with, not even footnotes, they're right on the, on the edge of the page, where they show that each part of the liturgy is somehow, if it's not a direct quotation from the scriptures, it comes from some sort of admonition of the scriptures. The, the Orthodox services are replete with the scriptures. And until you familiarize yourself with them, you don't even recognize that. The more you familiarize yourself with the scriptures, the more you realize the scriptures absolutely saturate Orthodox worship. Far more than, than Protestant worship. It absolutely saturates it. When I became a priest, there's all these prayers for the, when you put on each piece of the vestment. There's pre, pre, uh, prayers that a lot of people don't hear because they're part of the preparation of the gifts. When I read the scriptures all the way through, I went, oh my goodness, every single one of these is from the scriptures in some way or another. 
especially the Psalms, but many places of Scripture we find throughout. So, as Orthodox Christians, what we really have to do is instead of trying to look too Protestant with dedication to the Scriptures and to evangelism, what we really ought to do is out-Bible and out-evangelize the Protestants in this regard. That ought to be our goal. And of course, we want to do so in a very humble and loving way. The method may look a little different. Obviously, with the scriptures, for instance, we want to make sure we interpret in the light of the fathers. So we read them side by side. But at the same time, we want to make sure that our dedication is absolutely strong and foundational to our lives. An Orthodox Christian life looks like somebody who has a love, almost an obsession with the scriptures, and who loves to share his or her faith. By the way, a little note about the scriptures. In the early church, when buying a whole New Testament was basically impossible, a lot of Christians would have just a few verses written on some parchment, and they would keep it in a box at the entry of their home. Right when you walk in, there'd be a box with these scriptures. And they'd read those verses and memorize them. And you can imagine, in a large congregation, if you went through everyone, you almost had the entire New Testament memorized piece by piece. And what would they do with this box? As they exited and entered the home, they'd venerate it sign of the cross and venerate this box with the scriptures in them. That's how much love they had for the scriptures. People would go to St. John Chrysostom, daily services, and sit through homilies that would sometimes last 45 minutes, an hour, hour and a half. The only thing they were upset about was when he was done. They would applaud when he was done. I, I haven't had that happen. I've had people applaud when I was done, but not because they wanted more, because I was finally finished. This is how much they loved St. John Chrysostom preaching. Why? Because he went through the scriptures and explained in detail what the real meaning was. This is a powerful thing. And we ought to have that same love where we don't want a homily to end because we want to learn more about how to live our faith. We want to learn more to understand the scriptures better. So, with this, what are the main and most significant differences between orthodoxy and Protestantism? Well, this is a talk I'm going to try to do in just over an hour, so I really had to pick and choose. Um, I've been thinking about this talk for over a month now and trying to figure out what to talk about and what not to talk about and what to narrow it down to. So this is going to be missing a lot if we could really do a long series on this, but to keep it down to a, uh, a, a shorter time, I chose four main differences. Then we're going to look at some more specific, smaller differences, and then end with, with some final thoughts and uh, some, some resources to use. But the four main differences what will take up the bulk of our time today are, number one, differences in ecclesiology. We'll explain what that is. Number two, the Protestant belief in the doctrine of sola scriptura. Number three, the Protestant doctrine of sola fide. And four, some differences in the view of salvation and how we're saved. Okay, so we'll begin with ecclesiology. And ecclesiology is theology regarding the church as this is one of the most foundational areas of disagreement, and one of the most significant and important. It's important to note at the beginning of this that when the Protestant Reformation began, Luther had no intent, originally, of beginning a new church. That was not his intent. He sought to rescue the church from abuses he saw in Rome. Now, by the time, the time Luther died, I think he knew that he was creating a new church. He must have known by then. But at least at the beginning, the intent was to rescue the true church. But as I said, that idea really didn't hold for long. And one of the main reasons it didn't hold is because Protestantism quickly splintered. You had three main figures of the Protestant Reformation, Luther, Calvin, and, Calvin, and Zwingli, who didn't agree with one another. And so it became clear that there wasn't going to be greater unity through this Reformation, as much as they wanted it. And there have been attempts over the years to try to create more unity. But over time, many, many more denominations and branches broke off which were not communicating with, with one another. So this legacy of Protestantism is enough to call into question the hand of divine providence in their history, as disunity seems to be the mark of their history as a whole rather than unity. And that's a really sad thing people who have such fervency and love for Christ and the scriptures, that disunity seems to prevail. As more time goes on, there seem to be more and more denominations. So at one point, a supposed solution came about with the creation of what you see around you a lot. We have a lot of these in Salt Lake City, of the phenomenon of a non-denominational church. And these parishes essentially have no denominational affiliation. The idea was, okay, we have 
a don denomination here, a denomination here. You know, there's the First Baptist, First, first Presbyterian, First Methodist. We can't all agree on things, and we just keep growing the denomination. So what we'll do is we'll just have a Protestant church that's just Protestant. We're not going to give the name to it. It's just going to be non-denominational. And that way, we won't be splintered. Well, what are the problems with this? There's two main issues. Number one, stating that a parish does not belong to a denomination is simply a semantic change. The problem remains. That parish will teach certain doctrines that other Protestant bodies reject. And that same non-denominational church will reject some doctrines that others teach and affirm. So in other words, not giving a name to a particular set of teachings and practices doesn't actually fix the issue, it just avoids it. That's all you're really doing when you don't give a name. So you can take a non-denominational church and give it a name of a denomination, Nothing else changes, but suddenly now, oh, well, now, now we've created disunity. No, you, you didn't have it to begin with because you had disagreements about doctrine and worship. You just simply didn't want to talk about it. Secondly, the ecclesio ecclesiological justification for non-denominational parishes, or just even for the many growing number of Protestant denominations in existence, is that they fall under this idea known as the invisible church. The invisible church. And this term requires, requires some analysis. Now again, I had to leave a lot out on this, and so this isn't going to be a full analysis of it, but the idea of an invisible church states that basically all true Christians are invisibly united by sharing in the quote-unquote essential doctrines of Christianity and about Jesus, even while disagreeing on non-essential doctrines or non-essential worship or practices. And they may have different administrative bodies, but they're still united in these essential doctrines. Now, there are major issues with this idea. First, who decides which doctrines are essential and which are not? Who's going to decide that? Nowhere do the scriptures give a list of essential doctrines versus those on which there could be disagreements. You don't find it in the scriptures. You do find in the scriptures some places where St. Paul talks about the foundational beliefs of Christianity, in these, these sections of his writings that are believed to be early creeds, you know, two, maybe two or three verses, maybe just one verse, that goes over these foundational beliefs. But it would be wrong to conclude that because those were the foundational beliefs, that therefore anything outside of that was up for debate. Nowhere does it say that. There are also major disagreements about which doctrines are essential in the first place. We can't even agree on that. I would argue that proper ecclesiology is essential. For instance, that, that was one example, by the way. Proper ecclesiology, I believe, is essential. We disagree about that. Here's another one. According to the Seventh Holy Ecumenical Synod, the veneration of icons and the acceptance of their veneration is essential to being a Christian. So we have really no clear basis to delineate which doctrines are essential and which are not, nor to even state that such a distinction, as understood by Protestants, exists. Now, do we have some beliefs in Orthodoxy where we say, okay, you're free to kind of believe different things on this? Yes. But the Church has really established those over many centuries, over a couple of millennia. But there's no scriptural list that you can find. You can't find a list in Scripture where systematically it says, these are the things you must agree upon as Christians, and these are the things where you can have debates. It just doesn't exist that way. Number two, the idea of an invisible church causes, supposedly within, supposedly within the same body of Christ, it causes clear and significant contradictions in belief and practice. So those places where the supposed non-essentials are, there are major disagreements that contradict one another. Can you have in the same body of Christ contradictions? Can there exist contradictions within the perfect body of Christ? Well, Christ promised to send the Holy Spirit to, the, to lead the apostles, and thus the beginnings of the whole church, into what? Into all truth. All truth in John 16, 13. Yet, with the idea of an invisible church, just to name a few, Holy Communion, is both the true body and blood of Christ and is not 
the true body and blood of Christ, but is merely symbolic. Baptism is both essential for some Christians and nothing more than a public witness, not essential for other Christians. Once saved, always saved is both true and untrue at the same time. Mary is ever virgin, and Mary is also not ever virgin. The rapture is true, the rapture is also not true. Infant baptism is acceptable and good. Infant baptism is to be rejected as an abomination. The use of icons is okay. The use of icons is forbidden. The church is led by ordained ministers and bishops, and this is the proper administration of the church, and the church has no official hierarchical structure. The list goes on and on and on. How can we claim to be part of the same body of Christ when so many of these beliefs come into conflict with one another? Can you have these contradictions existing within the same body and truly believe that you are still in the same body? So the question becomes, well, if we have these disagreements, who do we go to in order to find the truth? Who do we go to to find correct belief? And that brings us to point number three. In matters of biblical interpretation, sound doctrine, and proper practices of worship, the scriptures lay out what as the highest guide. Not the scriptures, but the church. The church is labeled in 1 Timothy 3.15 as the pillar and foundation of the truth. There's a problem when the church is invisible. If the church is merely invisible, then we have no physical place to look to for answers. And these issues never get resolved. If the church is invisible, who do we go to to decide? Well, it depends on which denomination you go to, or which non-denominational church you go to. Some are going to say A, some are going to say B, and you have no way of delineating one from the other. And this means that any Christian can use his or her interpretation as the foundation for a new church. I suddenly understand things in a new way, I'm going to start my own church down the road because I'm the one who understands this best. This is what happened in Protestantism. In 500 years, rather than, as we would expect, more unity occurring in worship and belief practice, because everyone's studying the same Bible, everyone's been studying it more and more, we should expect more unity. No, the opposite has occurred. Protestantism has become more fractured and more individualized. So the doctrine of an invisible church simply covers over these issues rather than actually curing them. That's the problem with this doctrine of the invisible church. Now, I want to tell you just a little personal story about this. I was dressed basically this way in an airport once, and there was a woman who came up to me as I was sitting waiting for my plane. And she said, uh, she said, do you mind if I tell you something? I said, sure. She said, well, I was walking by and I saw you and the Holy Spirit told me that I need to give you a message. Great. And she said, the message is, you need to let go of some of the man-made traditions that you're desperately holding on to. And I said, wow, thank you. I probably wasn't the nicest about this, by the way. <laughs> I said, thank you so much. What traditions? And she said, well, I, I don't know. I said, well, the Holy Spirit told you. Come on, the Holy Spirit's got to tell you which traditions, because I don't know what this message means. And she said, well, the Holy Spirit didn't tell me that. And I said, wow, the Holy Spirit's not being very specific today. That was a little mean. <laughs> <laughs> and so I asked her a question. I said, tell me. When you have a question about the faith and you're not sure about a certain interpretation, what do you do? She said, oh, that's simple. I pray to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guides me to the right answer. I said, wow, that's beautiful. I said, but I'm, I'm a little confused. Have you ever had a parishioner who you had to disagree with about doctrine? She said, yes. And I said, and did you both pray to the Holy Spirit for guidance? She said, yes. And I said, did you come to the same conclusion? She said, no, there was still disagreement. I said, well, how did you know you were right? She said, well, I prayed to the Holy Spirit. I said, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> the other person did that too. I said, how do you know I even prayed that God guide me in my beliefs? I've come to very different conclusions. So I said, tell me, who's the final arbiter of this? Who gets to decide what's true and what's not? She said, well, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. I said, whoa, wait, 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 wait. You, you've already told me that you had somebody else pray to the same Holy Spirit and come to a different conclusion. So how do you know who's right? I said, who, where is the final author? In other words, what's the highest authority? And she said, the scriptures. I said, well, that's interesting because the scriptures tell me that the church is the highest authority. And she looked at me and she said, what are you talking? I said, well, 
in Timothy, it says the church is the pillar and ground of truth. So we're supposed to go to the church. So in order to find what the truth is, we got to find what the original church is. Does your church have a history that goes back 2,000 years? And she told me, I don't know if I can talk anymore, no longer. I, I'm going to be late for my flight. <laughs> and I said, no, 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 it's important. I tried to stop her. Anyway, again, I probably could have gone about it a little bit better. St. Paisius has a beautiful saying on this, by the way. It's one of my favorites. He says, somebody said, what should we do when we have conversations and disagreements with the heterodox? The heterodox are those who believe different things. Okay? And he said, he said, don't challenge them, don't argue with them. I, I would have done well not to argue with her. He said, just leave them with a holy sense of discomfort. It's one of my favorite words. Leave them with a holy sense of discomfort. I don't know if I did that too well, um, but this is the problem with this idea of the invisible church. There's no one to go to for proper interpretation. In Orthodox ecclesiology, we take the words of the scriptures very seriously. We're accused often of not taking the scriptures seriously enough. I say we, we take them far more seriously. The church is the body of Christ. One of the places it says that is 1 Corinthians 12, 27. It says it many other places. Ephesians is a good place. But the church is the body of Christ. Christ self-identifies with the church in Acts 9, 4. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Not why are you persecuting my church? He self-identifies with the church. Christ promises to send the Holy Spirit and thus establish the church who will help his followers forever. John 14, 16. And Jesus himself promises that he will be with his followers forever, even until the end of the age, Matthew 28, 20. So Christ promises to be with the church, to be in the church, and to never leave us. This is why the church is called his body. You can't be separated from your body if Christ is not separated from his body. This means that the idea, which some Protestants, not all, but some hold, of a general apostasy in which the church ceased to exist until it was reestablished is scripturally unsound and impossible. It is an anti-scripture doctrine to believe in the general apostasy of the church. It is absolutely against the scriptures. For a church to be the true church, the church that Christ promised the Holy Spirit to in order to lead her into all truth, and thus become the pillar and ground of the truth, this church must have four things. Number one, that church must have apostolic origins. If you cannot say that your church began with the apostles, it's not the church of the apostles, which means it's not the true church. Number two, it must have, because the early church had a hierarchy, it must have a continuous line of leadership from the time of the apostles until now. If you don't believe that there's a continuous line of hierarchy and that the apostles didn't actually set up their successors, you can read a book called the Apostolic Fathers, which is a bunch of letters and documents from the bishops and the church leaders who knew and were taught by and ordained by the apostles themselves. St. Ignatius' letters are in there. It's a great place to start. They must have a continuous line of leadership from the time of the apostles until now. By the way, you can find a list that begins with the apostle Peter and goes all the way to Patriarch John the Tenth in Antioch today. We have that list. I, I have them down in my office if you want to see it. Number three, the church must have unchanging doctrine or beliefs from the time of the apostles until now. What the apostles believed then, we believe now. Things don't change because the apostles were given the Holy Spirit to lead them into all truth. And four, the church must be unchanging in the essentials of Christian living and worship that is how we live and how we worship God from the time of the apostles until now. Now, does development occur? Yes. The first century, they didn't have this. They didn't have any bonus tests. Things can develop. But the essentials, the essentials do not change. Development happens, but we don't add or subtract to the essentials of the worship. You look at the time of the apostles, and all the way, you see Christians who fast the way we fast, who pray the way we pray. And the very first the very first explanations of what the divine liturgy looks like, St. Justin Martyr, the first great Christian apologist, gives a, a very little description of what the liturgy looks like. Guess what? He says the liturgy, liturgy is divided into two parts. There's a liturgy of the Word and then the liturgy of the faithful. Guess what? Our liturgy is divided into two parts. The liturgy of the Word, or catechism sometimes called, and the liturgy of the faithful. 
It's the same exact thing. And every description of the liturgy from then on looks like the liturgy we do today. Again, do things develop a little bit, get more elaborate? Of course. The beauty grows because the church wasn't being persecuted. They could have more elaborate services rather than just being private homes or caves. But the essentials are the same. What does this mean? It means that if you cannot uh, trace your church's leadership, worship, and beliefs back to the time of the apostles and find a continuous line of believers throughout history who believed and worshipped the same way and had the same leadership structure from the time of the apostles until today, it simply cannot be the true church. It cannot be the true church. Does that mean we decry everything about you? No. No, you retain many seeds of truth. There's many truths in there. But that truth is intermixed. It means it has some subtractions. It means it has some additions. And it means it has some changes. If you want the fullness of truth, unadulterated, you have to find the original church that Christ himself, through the Holy Spirit, established on Pentecost. And only Orthodoxy holds that claim. No Protestant. No Protestant. It's a tough one, sorry. <laughs> but no Protestant can look at the first millennium and find a single Christian who worships and believes as they worship and believe today. You cannot find a single one. <clears throat> what do we conclude from that? You either conclude that it's not the right church, or you conclude that somehow those who are further in time from the apostles know better than those who are closer to the time of the apostles. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it obviously doesn't make any sense. Okay. Let's talk about the, uh, the doctrine of sola scriptura. Sola Scriptura teaches that Christian doctrines must be found in the Bible as the Bible is the only, the sole source of proper belief. Four main problems with this assertion. Number one, we have to ask where the Bible came from. Where did the Bible come from? The Bible didn't just drop from heaven, you know, Christ ascended, and then suddenly they said, look out! Christ, look out below! <laughs> Bible. It didn't work that way. Nowhere in the Bible does it list which books are and are not part of the proper canon. The canon is the, the name for the list of books of the Bible. None of the churches of the first couple hundred years had complete and perfect canons of the New Testament. Do you know, if you had, a, if you had um, written out on parchment the ent uh, one entire gospel, in modern money it would cost you over a million dollars. No church had the whole entire 27 books of the New Testament. Origin. This, this church father who was eventually condemned, who lived from about 185 to 254, he was the first to figure out, or to, uh, the first figure to list out basically what we consider to be the New Testament today. However, he had a lot of reservations about certain books, he wasn't so sure about them, and he also accepted some books as divinely inspired that are not included in the canon. It was actually St. Athanasius the Great who in 367, first lays out a complete New Testament without additions or subtractions in one of his festal letters in an authoritative way. 367. That means for over 330 years after Christ had ascended, the church didn't think that it was all that important to list out what exactly was the New Testament. Why? Because to be a Christian meant to live in Christ, and it was the, it was the life of the faith, which we'll talk about in a little bit, it was the life of the faith that was foundational. The scriptures are foundational when it comes to doctrine, but they're not the only foundation. The Holy Spirit lives and breathes in the church and guides the church. So who had the authority to decide what books are and are not part of the, part of the Bible? The church. The church through its leadership, not just any leadership, holy leadership, through saints that had purified themselves and were filled with the same Holy Spirit who inspired the writing of the scriptures in the first place. The church came first. Between the scriptures and the church, the church came first. So Protestants, oddly enough, accept A, the legitimacy of Christianity at a time when the New Testament didn't even exist in the form it exists today. You could have said New Testament, they wouldn't know what you're talking about. And most Christian, Christian communities didn't even have all the books in the New Testament. And B, they accept the authority of the very church they now reject to decide what was and was not the New Testament. That church had the authority to decide these things, and they accept the decision, but they don't accept the church's authority on anything else. And that's a problem. The church came first, and the church 
guided by the Holy Spirit, is what decided what 27 books actually constitute the New Testament. <clears throat> the second issue with Sola Scriptura, interpretation of the Bible is necessary. Interpretation is necessary. What happens when you don't interpret the same way? You come to different conclusions. What happens when you come to different conclusions? You get thousands of denominations, <laughs> all disagreeing with one another. It's often said that what we need to do with the Bible is just simply use the clear passages to explain the difficult passages. But again, that's not objective. It's subjective, subjective because who decides which passages are clear and which are not? St. James says something that I find very clear. He says, one is not saved by faith alone. I think that's pretty clear. Luther thought that was a very complex statement, and it needed to be explained. In fact, what Luther originally wanted to do was just throw out the book of James. He wanted to take the epistle of James and just get rid of it. And one of his disciples said, uh, I don't think this is going to be a good idea. And he said, okay, how can we reinterpret this to make sure that it fits with the theology that we're teaching? So using the easy passages to explain the difficult passages doesn't work because you all bring a worldview into how you read the Bible in the first place. The only way to read it properly is to gain the mind of Christ, which happens through a life of asceticism and spirituality and growth in Christ. The only way. The strongest rebuttal to this idea, of course, is history. Because we've just shown that with time, Protestantism has become more fragmented, not less. They keep studying the Bible. You'd think over time they'd come to a clear explanation of what it actually says, what it actually means in all these doctrinal areas, and they'd come to an agreement and unity would prevail. That hasn't happened. You need proper interpretation. And that interpretation was promised to the church being the pillar and ground of truth. The third problem, sola scriptura fails its own test. Nowhere in the Bible does it affirm the doctrine of sola scriptura. Of course, if it did, that would be a big problem for those early churches when A, the New Testament hadn't been fully written yet, and B, even if it, after it had been fully written, most church, basically no churches had a full New Testament with them. It'd be a huge problem. But the typical verse given to defend the idea that sola scriptura is found in scriptures is 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17. They say, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, he, equipped for every good work. Now, two kind of issues with this. I heard, I heard on the radio once a Protestant explaining how this, this verse, or these verses actually do prove sola scriptura. And he went into this long explanation. Now, maybe my first argument he couldn't really, he, he would argue with. The second one I think he'd have a tough one with, a tough time with. But the first argument that we would have is, is this. It, it, it doesn't say all scripture and only scripture is good for all this. It is, as we just discussed, improperly interpreted to say that. That would be like me saying all water is good for the health of the body. That doesn't mean that something couldn't be added to the water, that's not water itself, that would make drinking it detrimental or even deadly, just like the scriptures can be misinterpreted and made deadly to the soul. It also doesn't mean that a person doesn't also need food and exercise. So just because the scriptures are good and profitable for all these things, it doesn't mean that that's the only thing that's necessary for these things. But there's a much, does that make sense? By the way, okay. There's a bigger problem though, really, really big problem. If you say, no, 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 this is what St. Paul meant. He meant that the scriptures and only the scriptures. And again, I had, I listened to this, this radio program where this Protestant used the Greek text and he went through this whole explanation of it. He said, he said, it's very clear that what he meant was the scriptures and only the scriptures. What's the problem with that? Well, if you need only the scriptures for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness, we have to ask which scripture was St. Paul writing about when he wrote those words? Do you think he meant the New Testament? The New Testament wasn't around yet. He wrote this before the New Testament had even been finished. He was talking about the Old Testament book. So if we take that mean, we have to say that Christians should read the Old Testament and only the Old Testament. And no, no New Testament should exist. After all, as I said, he wrote it before the entire New Testament had been written. And are we to believe that when he wrote these words, he knew that those words themselves would someday be counted as scripture? Probably not. So sola scriptura fails its own test as the scriptures point to the church, again, as the pillar and foundation of the truth, not the scriptures. Again, I'm not saying that the scriptures aren't foundational. The scriptures are foundational. They're absolutely foundational to the truth. 
The Orthodox Church understands that the Scriptures were written at the guidance of the Holy Spirit by witnesses of Christ. This is significant. But the Scriptures were written at the inspiration of the Holy Spirit who is still at work in the Church today. And this is going back to this discussion of ecclesiology. I would say that deep down, only the Orthodox Church, when compared to Protestantism, understands that the Church as the body of Christ is a living body. The Church is a living body where the Holy Spirit continues to pulse as blood through the veins of a person. It pulses through the Church and guide and guard the Church. When we base everything on the Scriptures and Scriptures alone and there's no Holy Spirit guiding the Church, the body has ceased to grow and move. Thus, we have in the Orthodox Church something called Holy Tradition. Holy Tradition is not, is not a cosmic game of telephone. You ever play telephone as a kid? I'm going to whisper a phrase to my friend, they whisper to another person, they whisper to another person, on and on and on. And by the end, what the person says is completely different from what I actually said in the first place. That's not what this is. Vladimir Lasky defined it probably best when he said, Holy tradition is the life of the Holy Spirit in the Church. The life of the Holy Spirit in the Church. This means that the Holy Spirit continues to guide and guard the Church. And just as the New Testament was written by men filled with and guided by the Holy Spirit, so there are men and women, the saints, who have so purified their heart that they too, after emptying their heart of egoism, have filled it instead with the Holy Spirit, and that Holy Spirit helps them to properly interpret the Scripture. It's like reading, as an analogy, a deep, complex medical textbook. Those with medical training will read and understand that book in one way. But those without any medical training, like me, would read it without proper understanding. We'd be confused by it. We might try to figure it out and say, well, I'll just use the easy passages to figure out the tough passages. I will never understand it the same way as a surgeon would. To read God-inspired words written by Holy Spirit-filled men, one must live that same life being spirit-filled as well, to truly understand them. This is what we look for in the church. Now, does that mean that every individual saint is perfect and unerring? No, which is why we look to the collective voice of the saints. We look to their consensus. We say, okay, if St. Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit, he certainly had a great understanding. What happens when we have 30 men and women filled with the Holy Spirit, and they all come to an agreement on something? We know they're being guided properly. By the way, as a practical example of this, this doesn't always happen in a very direct way, but sometimes it happens in an incredibly direct way to illustrate what, on a spiritual plane, visibly is always happening. This happened in the life of St. John Chrysostom, who is the greatest expositor of the scriptures, and especially the letters of St. Paul. So one day, one of his disciples was walking by his room to, say, to go talk with him, but he noticed someone was already in the room with St. John Chrysostom talking with him. This disciple's name was Proclus, St. Proclus. He looks inside and he sees somebody whispering in St. John's ear. And St. John is like really focused and writing down every word he hears. And so Crocus goes, okay, I'll come back later. And he comes back later and no one's there. And he goes and talks with St. John and he goes, you know, who was that who was in here with you earlier? In here with me, or what are you talking about? Because yeah, somebody was in here with you and they were whispering in your ear, you're writing down everything that they were saying. He goes, I don't, what are you talking about? And he goes, yeah, there was somebody here whispering while you were writing. And St. John Chrysostom happened to have an icon of St. Paul, and he goes, do you look like this? And Procopius goes, that's, yes, that's the guy. You can find an icon of this really beautiful, of St. Paul whispering in the ear of St. John Chrysostom as he writes one of his homilies. And his, his homily is on parchment, but as it flows down, it then becomes a river, and all the faithful are taken from the river and taking cups and drinking from it. It's a really beautiful image. By the way, St. John Chrysostom's skull is on Mount Athos, and there's one part of his skull that remains incorrupt to this day, his right ear. You can see pictures of this online. The pictures of his right ear, which remains incorrupt. This is holy tradition. This is how the Holy Spirit continues to work. Okay. I thought I was going quick. Uh, <laughs> we'll keep going. Okay. Sola fide. This is the idea that one is saved by faith alone. Okay. Now, again we have the problem of scriptural interpretation with this. Luther insists on this. This is the foundation of the whole Protestant Reformation. One is saved by faith alone, no works. Now what does St. Paul say? St. Paul says, 
We're saved by grace through faith. And there are times when he's talking about how we're not saved by works, and he says, says we're saved by faith. Now, when he's talking about works, we have to understand what he's talking about specifically are the works of the law. And mainly he's talking about one particular thing from the law, which was circumcision. He's mainly talking about how the Judaizers who are insisting on circumcision, circumcision is not going to save you. You're saved by faith in Christ. Now, Luther thought this needed to be made clearer. And so Luther, who was all about sola scriptura, decided he was going to change the scriptures. I don't know if you know if you're aware that he did this, but he did. He took when St. Paul says you're saved by faith, and he added a word. He added the word alone. Now again, I've heard Protestants, modern Protestants, defend this and say, well, that's just, that's just expounded upon what the meaning of that verse is. You're saved by faith alone. There's a really big problem with this, though. Huge. Ironically, there is only one place in the entire New Testament where the words faith and alone are found side by side. They're actually found together. There's only one place. And it's in the epistle of St. James, where St. James says, one is not saved by faith alone. This is why Luther wanted to get rid of that book. <laughs> it's the only place in the scripture you find those words actually together. So again, there are major problems of interpretation. What do we mean by the word faith? Well, is faith just a mental belief in something? If I just mentally believe in Jesus, that's saving faith? Not according to James. James tells us that true faith is not mere belief because the demons believe. And rather than being saved, they shudder. They shudder in fear of that belief. So clearly, just a mere belief in something is, is not really saving faith. So some Protestants, they say, well, no, 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 no. What you really need is you need faith and assent. You need to agree to that belief. But what did the Lord say? The Lord says that among those on his left side of judgment, those who are awaiting eternal hell, will be those who call him Lord. Lord, Lord, when did we see you hungry? Lord, Lord, when did we see you thirsty? Well, they seem to have ascended to him as their Lord. He also says very clearly in another passage, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom. So it seems that belief and assent to the idea that Christ is Lord is not enough. It gets a little more complex than that little thought experiment that I like to do. What if somebody came up to you and said, you know what? I do believe in Jesus. I believe he is God. And I accept his salvation. But I hate him. I hate him. I actually, I actually just don't want to go to hell because I don't want to be punished forever. So I think out of the better option than hell would be heaven. And so I, I, I don't like Christ. I think it's terrible that he made me to exist. And I really hate him for that. But you know what? I, I'd rather have heaven than hell, so I, I accept that too. Is that saving faith? Can you hate Christ and be in heaven? No, which means what is necessary? Love. So you need belief, you need assent, and you need love. Well, St. John tells us that if we love God, but don't keep his commandments, we're liars. So that means that saving faith is belief and assent and love and the keeping of God's commandments. We also know that we can't serve two masters. So we can't serve Christ and his commandments and our own sinful will at the same time. So we need to empty ourselves of that will. We need to empty ourselves and fight against the slavery to the flesh. And that means we need humility. So saving faith means assent, or I'm sorry, belief, assent, love, the struggle to follow the commandments, and humility. As you can see, the scriptures talk about faith being much more complex than we're often led to believe. We're often led to believe that faith is simply a yes or no proposition. You either have faith or you don't. But again, the scriptures talk about faith lying on a spectrum. You can have great faith or little faith. You can have healthy faith or broken faith. If your faith is the size of a mustard seed, you can work miracles and even move mountains. I've tried this. They don't move. My faith is not the size of a mustard seed, apparently. I need to grow my faith. So what do we have? We have broken faith seeking wholeness. Or another way of saying this is, we have broken faith seeking perfect faith. You hear me just say this all the time. We have faith seeking faith. We're constantly growing in our faith. And thus, our following of Christ's commandments and living of the virtues are both a sign of the faith within us, 
which is what Protestants say, but it's also a means by which we grow that faith. There's no dichotomy in the Orthodox Church between faith and works. Those two are intertwined to basically be the same thing. This is what Protestants don't seem to understand. Faith and works cannot be separated. You cannot have faith without works, St. James says that, and you cannot have true works without faith. The two come hand in hand. A little side note, by the way, we could ask the question, is faith a choice? Do I choose whether to believe or not? If I do choose, then faith itself is a work. You see, the two are combined. And if faith is not a choice, then we don't have free will. And we're all Catholics. That's a problem, too. But ultimately, we're told that grace saves. Grace saves. So when somebody looks at the Orthodox and they say, well, you believe in faith by, or in salvation by works, my answer is no, we don't. We believe in salvation by grace. Our works won't save us. Grace will save us. But we need a living faith. Really what the scriptures call us to is not faith, but faithfulness. A life of faith. This is why whenever Christ says repent, the translation is not very good. The voice is continuous. It just doesn't sound good in English to say, be repenting. But that's what he's actually saying. Be repenting. Live a life of repentance. Constantly turning towards Christ. You, you know, I'm sure all of you have heard me, maybe a couple of you haven't, but you've heard me give the glass analogy. What is salvation for the Orthodox Church? It's a working together with Christ, which we'll talk about in a second. A working of the efforts of man and the efforts of God meeting together. So my glass analogy is imagine if I'm holding a clear glass right here, and what I really want to do is take a, a drink of water. And not just any water but the living water that Christ talks to the Samaritan woman about. I'll give you this water which if you drink up, you'll never thirst again. And she says, give me some. We want that water. But this glass is my heart. And my heart isn't full of that living water yet. It's full of a lot of sin, mainly egoism. And that egoism is dirt. And some of that dirt has been calcified and become like rock. So what do we need to do to fill my glass with, with grace, with water? We need to scoop out the dirt, efforts of man, pour the water in efforts of God. Now, as you do that, that water gets muddy, which is why sometimes you don't see the progress happening in your own spiritual life. That's okay. You keep working it. You keep scooping, scooping, scooping. You keep pouring, pouring, pouring. You scoop through asceticism, through fasting, through prayer, through works of virtue, frustration, through vigil, through any act of humility and selflessness. You scoop it out and you come to church and through prayer and mainly through confession and communion other means, you pour water in. What is a saint? A saint is one who has been so cleaned of that dirt that the water's poured in and then overflows the entire world. And that's what a saint is. So, here's the, here's the deal. If I'm out in the desert and I'm dying of thirst, does scooping out the dirt save me? No. The water is what's going to save you. But scooping out the dirt is necessary to get the water in the glass in the first place. We need to work out our salvation. But the works don't save us. Grace saves us. But of course, I'm not going to do that process without faith. And even the scooping out, by the way, takes grace. <laughs> we, need, we need Christ's help even to do that. He's constantly working with us. So with that, let's talk about that final topic of salvation. Again, this could be a topic in itself. We could talk about this forever. Way too extensive to explain here. So I just want to make a couple of quick points before we move on to the smaller issues. Much of Protestantism seems to see salvation as a legal exchange. Now, there's different theories about salvation. Again, we don't need to get into those today. But they basically fall into that category of a legal exchange of one sort or another. Orthodoxy emphasizes relationship with Christ as the means of salvation. It's kind of ironic as Protestants talk most often about a personal relationship with Jesus. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? And the Orthodox Church would say, of course. Of course. And I have it on his terms based on how he revealed it to the church. But we say that a little cautiously with a lot of love and just plant that little seed to make them uncomfortable and <laughs> don't do what I did in the airport. <laughs> so, now, relationships take what? They take work and time and progress. And so does salvation. Christ cannot be in communion with us fully if we continue to commune with darkness and filth. You can't serve two masters. You can't fill your heart up with more dirt and more water at the same time. It's one or the other. And thus, we seek grace to help us purify ourselves of sin, scoop that dirt out, and then to fill us and illumine us. Grace will purify us and then illumine us. The typical Orthodox response to the question, are you saved, is I was saved in baptism, I am being saved through my struggle to live in Christ now, and I hope to be saved in the age to come. It's not a bad answer, by the way. I like the answer. It shows that the process 
is really not just becoming like Christ, but really becoming Christ. We've got to basically making our homes, our hearts, a suitable throne for Christ. When Christ tells us the kingdom of heaven is within you, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, he's telling us that our heart becomes a throne for the kingdom. And this is what we're seeking to do. Elder Arseny Papachok, this great Romanian elder, he describes this, this topic of salvation a little bit in this way, and how we seek to have Christ dwell within us and shine within us. And he has this great little story that I think is one of the best explanations of salvation I've ever heard. He said, salvation is like this. You go to the gates of paradise, and you knock. And you hear from a voice inside, it's Christ, and he says, who is it? And you respond, it is me, Lord, your faithful servant. And he says, I don't recognize that voice. Go away. Go away. And so you stop and you knock again. And Christ says, who is it? And you say, it is you, Lord. And he says, I recognize you. Enter into paradise. This is salvation from the Orthodox perspective. We seek to have Christ live within us because we can't save ourselves. We need he who is salvation to be within us. But, having said all this, I'd like to promote, pr uh, propose that there's a much more important question than are you saved? And one that really gets to the heart of the Orthodox experience. I find the issue of, of the, the question, are you saved? Although it's, it's not a bad question, it's just, you know, it's not about being good or bad. It's, it's again, like faith, it lies on a spectrum. And I think there's a higher question than this. St. Paul in Romans says something really quite shocking. He says that if all of his brethren, the Jews, could be saved, only if he were accursed, meaning he was sent to hell, he'd take that deal. If I could be accursed and all of you would be saved because of that, I'd take that deal. That tells me that the most important question is not, are you saved? Rather, do you love Christ and do you love like Christ? Are you willing to fully sacrifice yourself for others? That's a way more significant and to me more interesting question. St. Porfirio said the same type of thing, and many of the modern saints did, that if, if, if them being sent to hell would mean that everyone else could be saved, they would take that deal. You know what I love about that? That's a heart that is so full of love and so full of heaven already, that wherever they go, they transform that area into heaven. They'd be sent to hell, and hell would become heaven because of what in, what's contained in their hearts. They bring heaven with them wherever they go. That's a much greater goal, and it's one that avoids pride. This is my issue with that, that question, are you saved? A lot of times it's answered with a lot of pride. Yes, I'm saved. But are you saved? You didn't say the sinner's prayer? You didn't believe it the way I believe? Are you really saved? That's for Christ to decide. But I don't live with fear of my salvation because I ask myself every day, are you struggling to love Christ a little bit more? God willing, he sees my pitiful efforts and he accepts it. And God is love, so I trust in that. I trust in his love much more than my supposed faith, which isn't even the size of a mustard seed and can't even move a mountain. So that, that to me is the much more important question. Do you love Christ and do you love like Christ? And I think that's really what we ought to focus on in our spiritual lives. Seek to love Christ a little bit more every day. Okay, let's go through some of the um, smaller differences and we'll just kind of speed through some of these. So, again, I won't be able to give a full treatment to any of them. That's okay. Icons is a good place to start. Where you look around this in the Orthodox Church, there's icons. Uh, there's a story I know of. <laughs> I was there one day. I was in a church in Idaho, and uh, somebody, a Protestant, wanted to check out the church because a lot of members of uh, her parish had converted to Orthodoxy, and she wanted to find out what's this all about. And she walked in and started railing against the icons. Oh, these are all icons! What are you guys doing? What are you guys doing? I can't. And, and like five minutes of the service, she's like, I can't, I can't handle anymore. She darted out of the service, never to be seen again. At least not in that parish. So this is this is common among Protestants to see the use and veneration of icons as worship and idolatry. The Seventh Holy Ecumenical Synod dealt with this issue, and kind of strangely enough, the Protestants who decry icons use the exact same arguments that the Universal Church in the eighth century condemned at that council. All Christianity already already dealt with that issue, and all Christians after a, a short while believed the same about icons. And they condemn this belief. So the main argument that Protestants use is the use of Old Testament passages that ban the creation and usage of idols and quote-unquote graven images. Now the, there's two main reasons that this ban was given by God. 
God told Moses that no one has seen God. And so you can't depict one who you've never seen. You guys are depicting all, you've you got this, this, uh, this bull that you created, you've got this idol here that you created, and there are all of these images, these gods you've never seen. How can you depict me if no one's seen my face? You can't see my face and live. So you can't depict me because you don't even know what I look like. And the second reason, which is, is built in, into this, this whole scene, is that the Israelites were very prone to adulterous worship practices, worshiping the gods of other nations. They did this again and again and again. In fact, much of uh, the Old Testament is just this kind of going back and forth between God saying, don't worship graven images. Okay, well, let's worship graven images. Okay, boom. You guys are, are uh, punished for this. Okay, we're not going to worship graven images. Oh, wait, but what about this one? No, boom, you're punished. And it's just a constant back and forth. We kind of laugh at them, but I mean, this is like our daily spiritual life, right? I'm not going to do this again, God. Oh, wait, I did it again. I'm not going to do this again, which is why we have confession. So <laughs> you can breathe easy. You're not the only one. With the coming of Christ, though, all of this changed. Now God had been seen in Jesus Christ, and true worship was revealed. In fact, we, we chant this every theophany. Every theophany we chant the hymn of the baptism of Christ, where it says that the worship of the Trinity has been made manifest. This is true worship. And again, it wasn't just theophany, it was also transfiguration. In the ascension, we see the true worship revealed. Now, Christianity is actually overcoming the worship of idols. Christians aren't so prone to idol worship. We're avoiding that. There's also this great argument in, in, uh, in contradiction to what the Protestants say that the use of the Old Testament, Testament uh, or the, the Old Testament prohibition on idols was just on idols, not on images. The Old Testament, God did not ban images. Right after he says, don't use idols, like not that many verses later, he actually commands the creation of images on the Ark of the Covenant. He says, make these seraphim on the top. Make them out of gold. This is what they're going to look like. On the curtains of the temple, there are images. Archaeology has shown that Jewish synagogues at the time of Christ were absolutely covered with frescoes. They had images all the time. They just knew that the images couldn't be idols. They couldn't worship them. We don't worship icons, period. We do not. We worship God alone, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's it. We don't worship Mary. We don't worship the saints. We, don't, we certainly don't worship icons. We do venerate icons. Because we believe icons are not just art, but they actually make present the figures depicted. And when we venerate them, when we show them honor and respect and love, the veneration that's shown to them is passed on to the figure depicted. This is uh, my, uh, my wife's uncle, Father Dan Suju, gives this beautiful story about when his kids were young and he'd have them they'd clean outside, and from inside the house he'd stick his cheek up against the window and they'd come and kiss him, and he'd ask them. Who did you kiss? And they'd say, you, Papa. And he'd say, what did your lips touch? They'd say, glass. This is the way icons work. Your lips touch wooden paint, but the veneration is passed on to the figure depicted. This is also a confirmation of the incarnation. To depict Christ's iconography is to confirm that God became man. For any Protestant who doesn't like that we have an icon of Christ, I would ask, if you could go in a time machine and bring your phone or a camera and take a picture of Christ, would you not take that picture? And if you had that picture next to your bedside, would you not kiss it before going to bed every single night? Of course you would. Of course you would. Which sometimes people kiss pictures of their departed grandma, and they get upset that we kiss icons? Why? Why? It's an expression of love. Family photos is sometimes what people call icons. There's a lot more to this discussion. There's two main books from these two great saints that describe the orthodox theology of iconography and the defense of the use and, and veneration of icons. Both of them are in English. The first is from St. Theodore the Studite. He was in a, in a monastery called Studion, so he's known as St. Theodore the Studite, and it's simply called On the Holy Icons. Again, it's in English. It's from St. Vladimir Press, a uh, popular patristic series. And from the same series is St. John of Damascus's work, Three Treatises on the Divine Images. Three Treatises on the Divine Images. Both of these books, again, available in English, ready, readily available, and good places to, to uh, read about uh, how, the, um, how the Church defends the veneration of icons and how it's absolutely scriptural. And not only scriptural, but the Seventh Ecumenical Synod says icons are necessary. They're essential to true worship, if we want that worship to be complete. Okay, let's talk uh, just very briefly about Mary. There are 
varied beliefs uh, that come into conflict with uh, a lot of Protestant uh, viewpoints, but commonly there's a rejection, commonly, not, not fully, but there's a common rejection of the ever virginity of Mary and of her veneration in the Orthodox Church from Protestant circles. So we'll talk more about the veneration of saints just right after this, but the ever virginity I want to focus a little bit on. Many Protestants would be rather surprised to find out that the ever virginity of Mary was actually upheld. It was believed by Luther, by Calvin, and by Zwingli, the three pillars of the Protestant Reformation. All three of them accepted it. This was an issue that had already been dealt with long before, a thousand years before the Protestant Reformation. St. Jerome. St. Jerome dealt with this, and you can find uh, from the Catholic University of America Press, you can find his dogmatic works. He has a work in there specifically defending the ever virginity of Mary. Now, there are many, many pieces of evidence, but I just want to point to a few for now. First, uh, Protestants will often cite Matthew 125, which says that Joseph knew not her, or knew her not, knew Mary not, until she had born a son. And they say, well, until here means clearly that he knew her afterwards. In other words, he had, he had normal marital relations with her afterwards. But the problem is, is that until in the scriptures often does not mean up until and only then. It means up until and from then on. You see this again and again. For instance, in the Psalms, sit thou at my right hand, until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Does that mean after we, he makes the enemies thy footstool, suddenly no longer on the right side? No, of course not. Of course not. So until is, is used, in, and there's many other examples. Again, I, I don't have time to go through all of them, but there's many examples of the word until is used in that way. The second really important point to make is that in the Gospel of John, you see Christ on the cross looking at Mary and at the Apostle John. Woman, behold thy son, son, behold thy mother. In other words, he gives the care of his mother over to St. John the Evangelist. This would have been a scandal. This would have been a scandal in Jewish culture at that time if Jesus had brothers. Because the care of the mother was given to the oldest son who was alive. The oldest son died, and the next son, the next son, the next son. This would have been an absolute scandal, and I guarantee St. John would have included some explanation here of why this was okay. The third point is that really, when we see, read about Christ's brothers, that word brother can mean three things. It can mean brother, like we normally say. It could mean half-brother, or it could even mean cousin. So there's not a lot of clarity in the scriptures about what, what we're talking about here. So what's the Orthodox viewpoint? The tradition that we have holds that Mary, Mary was not married to, first of all, she wasn't married to Joseph at all. She was betrothed. They went to a betrothal, but not a full marriage service. And Mary, who was very young at the time, teenager, was being betrothed to a man who was much older. Joseph was actually much, much older. He was never meant to marry her in the normal way. He was meant to be her protector. He was very old because he'd already been married and was a widower. And he had previous children from that marriage. So those are the ones who are named the brothers and sisters of Christ in the scriptures. They were half-brothers and sisters. Uh, if you want a very, very good book that's not, it's not difficult and it's not very long, St. John of San Francisco wrote a beautiful book. Uh, I think it's called On the Proper Veneration of Mary in the Orthodox Church or something like that. Does anybody know the, the proper title? I forget. It's, it's something along those lines. But if you look up St. John of San Francisco, he wrote a really beautiful book that goes through various heresies regarding Mary, all the way up to the contemporary Immaculate Conception Doctrine of, of Catholicism. And then he gives a, a nice little chapter at the end about the proper veneration of Mary. It's a really beautiful book. Everyone should read that at some point. Okay. In talking about the veneration of Mary, we'll just talk about the veneration of the saints in general. Veneration, as I said, differs from worship. Veneration is showing honor and respect and love to figures and asking for their intercessions. It's asking for their intercessions. We, we do have prayers to saints, but really those prayers are asking their intercessions. It's very different from praying to God directly. You know, we, we don't, wouldn't pray to a saint for forgiveness from them. We pray that God will forgive us through their prayers. And so we're really asking their intercessions. This is the same as we would do with one another. So the main verse that people use to fight against this idea of the veneration of saints is they say, well, the scriptures are clear. St. Paul says there's one mediator between God and man. The Lord Jesus Christ, one mediator. You guys are using the saints as mediators. Well, is the word mediator talking about asking intercessions and prayers in that case? 
Would the Protestants say that I couldn't look to you and say, please pray for me? And I'll pray for you? Of course they wouldn't say that. And if, if you actually look directly at that passage in scriptures, St. Paul, right before saying this, that there's one mediator between God and man, talks about how we need to pray for our leaders. So he clearly thinks it's fine to pray for one another. When he says there's one mediator, he means one who will reconcile us to God. Only Christ can fully reconcile man to God. That's not the same thing as asking prayers and intercessions. Now, other people will say, yeah, but why would you ask the saints to pray for you? Why not just pray to God directly? Well, why would I ask other people to pray for me? Because prayers in great numbers are more powerful than prayers alone. Christ himself says when two or three are gathered in my name, why wouldn't I want the saints praying for me? And then they'll say, yeah, are the prayers of the saints somehow more powerful? Like, don't you think all prayer is equal? Not according to James. St. James says the prayers of a righteous man avail as much. That means the prayers of an unrighteous man don't avail as much. So we want those who have been reproved by the church as being holy figures, filled with grace to pray for us. So how can we be assured that these saints are even aware of our prayers and they're praying for us? We can put together, I've heard, I had Protestants tell me this, there's no scripture that says that. And I always tell them, actually the scriptures do say this, but you have to look. You have to look properly. You have to, you have to look at, and, and piece together things, just like everyone does for certain doctrines. So where do we start? We start with St. Paul. St. Paul says, for me to live and to die is gain. To die is gain, not loss. So why would he lose the ability to pray for others? If for him to live as Christ and to die is gain. There's gain. There's increase when we die. We're closer to God in a way. So then the question becomes, well, okay, you're closer to God, but what do you actually do with your time? What do you do after you die? If you're righteous, what do you do? Well, we have the answer in the transfiguration. The transfiguration, Peter, James, and John go up Mount Tabor with Christ, and he begins to shine, and who appears next to him? Moses and Elijah. And what are they doing? Conversing with Christ. So, to die is gain, and when we die, we stand at the throne of Christ, and we can converse with him. Beautiful. Oh, well, yeah, but that doesn't mean that they're aware of our prayers. They don't know what we're doing. I had, this one woman went to my aunt, she said, when you're dead, you're dead. And I thought, well, that's not even close to Christian. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, death has been destroyed. <laughs> so, no, no, when you're dead, according to St. Paul, you're more alive. But what do you do? We have the answer in the story of the rich man, Lazarus. You know the story? Rich man, he feasts sumptuously. Lazarus is in there begging. You know, he even wants the crumbs from his table. They both die. Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham, this picture of paradise. And the rich man is suffering. And the rich man has two requests. The first is, can Lazarus dip his finger in some water and touch my tongue? He said, no. And the second was, can he at least go up here to my brothers and warn them about what fate awaits them if they don't change their way of life? Here's somebody suffering in Hades, who is aware of and concerned for his brothers. Do you think that those in hell can be aware of and concerned for their loved ones and those in paradise cannot? Of course not. Of course not. So what, 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 why do we believe in this? Because when the righteous die, they go at the throne of Christ, they converse with him, and they're aware of us and our requests. And so they intercede for us. This is why we ask the intercession of the saints. And this is why we venerate them. Okay, holy mysteries. We can't get very far into this. <laughs> this, is, this is a really, really big topic. But there's just a couple points I wanted to make about this. Each holy mystery, or what we call the sacraments sometimes, would require its own time segment. So I just want to go through a couple of general points. First of all, the holy mysteries are simply manifestations or communicants, we could say, of grace before us using physical means. There's some physical means that portray grace to us. And baptism is the water, the Holy Communion, the bread and wine becomes the body and blood of Christ. You, you would have to completely separate the invisible and spiritual realm from the material world in order to deny holy mysteries altogether. I've had, again, I've heard Protestants say that they, they don't believe in anything called sacraments or holy mysteries, they don't believe they exist at all. But that would mean that you have to completely separate the invisible from the visible, the immaterial from the material. Well, then what did Christ do? Christ literally united these two things in himself. Fully God, fully man. In one person, the invisible and the invisible was all there. Father Josiah Trenton makes this really great point.
point where he says, whether they like it or not, every single church has sacraments. He says, what do you want? The sinner's prayer. They believe that actually does something to your soul. That's a sacrament. The altar call. They believe that does something. That's a sacrament. Whether you like it or not, every single denomination has ritual and physical means of obtaining grace. All the holy mysteries of orthodoxy come directly from the instructions of Christ, whether directly from him in his words or from the epistles, where they were clearly taught by Christ. Often the number seven is given, but to say that there's seven holy mysteries is really more of a heuristic or it's an instructional purpose that we say seven, is to make it simple to learn these things. But St. Justin Popovich has the best response to this. He says, he says, every single Lord have mercy prayed in the church, call down the grace of God, and thus every Lord have mercy is a holy mystery. So every action of the church is a holy mystery, which means how many holy mysteries are there? They're infinite. There's an infinite number of holy mysteries. But there's really only one. Because Jesus Christ, who united material and immaterial, the human and divine, as we just said, into, in his person, now dispenses grace to us. So really, Jesus Christ is the one holy mystery, and he simply manifests himself in his grace in different means. It's beautiful. It's like so odd. That's why I love St. Justin Popovich. It's such a great way of looking at these things. Okay, last thing before closing remarks. Call no man father. I wasn't going to include this one because it's so specific and a lot of Protestants don't have an issue with this, but some do, and some have a very big issue. They say, you know, I, I've had some who are friends with, you know, but they, they'll only call me Paul. They won't call me Father Paul. They refuse to call me Father Paul. It's fine. But their reason for it is, again, about interpretation. They see that Christ says, call no man Father. And they say, well, I'm just going to take that literally. That's one of the easy passages. And I would say, well, is it that easy? Because let's look at some other scriptures. From Acts 7. And Stephen said, it's right before he's stoned, Brethren and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Iran. Oh boy, that, that Stephen is just really, really disobedient. Or that's not really what it means. 1 Corinthians 4. I do not write this to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Boy, St. Paul. It's an issue with him, or we don't really interpret it properly. Romans 4. Therefore the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. So even in the New Testament, we see the word father used again and again and again. In the same New Testament, where we see Christ saying, don't call no man father. So what's the issue here? Well, Christ also said, call no man teacher. Does that mean that if you go to school and you say, this is my teacher, you're somehow against the gospel? You're somehow in, in condemnation of the gospel? Of course not. Now, I know plenty of Protestants who are men and who have children, and their children call them dad. Is it with the specific word father? Is it like some magical force to the word father, but dad and papa and those things are okay? Of course, that would, that would be ridiculous. The issue was the pride of the Pharisees. When Christ talked about this, he said, you call no man father. In other words, there's no ultimate father and teacher but God. And so we don't take a human authority over God. That's what he's talking about. He's not talking about the term father. If he were, all these other scriptural passages would be very problematic. So there's no issue with calling priests father. There's no issue with that. It's, it's, it, now, if, if I became a heretic and I created my own version of Christianity or my own faith, and you, you said, you know, Father Paul is the father of us all in the faith, well, that would be really problematic, both for you and me. No, that's what we want to avoid. God is the father of us all in the ultimate sense. Okay. Some closing remarks as I went over again. There's a large uh, call of Protestants to Orthodoxy today. It began in the, mainly in the 1980s and has continued on. We see a lot of people converting from Protestantism to Orthodoxy. Again, that's where you can look at the Protestantism as actually creating a lot of fervor in them and a lot of love for Christ. And we see that as a very positive thing. And they find new expressions of that love in Orthodoxy. The problem is that in Protestantism, there's, there's not a lot of direction given. Because Protestantism was not made as a positive movement. It was made as a negative movement. What I mean by that, it was not made to obtain something greater. It was made to go against something that already existed. It was an anti-Catholic 
movement, which is why it's called Protestant Spain, word for protest. It was a movement based in protesting against Roman Catholic abuses. The problem with that is that many Protestants see orthodoxy and they just dismiss a lot of it and say, that looks really Catholic, and boom, it's dismissed right off the bat. But to repeat one of the earliest points, if we're going to seek Christ, we want to seek the church that he established and that he called to, that's called his body. We want to seek that out as best as possible. We forget that the Protestants weren't the first ones to disagree with the Catholics. The Orthodox were. We had a big argument over this that lasted for hundreds of years and eventually was called the Great Schism. Really, if we want to find the true church, we don't want to base ourselves off of a branch that broke off of a branch that had already broken from the tree. Catholicism was a large branch that already broke off the tree, and then Protestants broke off of that and said, we're going to reestablish the real thing. You don't need to reestablish what never ceased to exist. You want to try to find the true vine, the original vine, that still contains the fullness, and that's an orthodoxy. So how can we be sure of this? I recommend that people go about this a holistic way. Look to what I said. Look to the worship. Look to the beliefs and doctrines. Look to the leadership and see if you can find a continuous line. I would argue only in orthodoxy you find that. Most importantly, though, I would argue to look for the results. Look for the results. What do I mean by that? Let's say you want to become a brain surgeon. You want to give Father Paul the gift of a brain one day. Good luck. And you decide that you want to look to two universities, and you do some research on these universities, and you find out that the first university has some of the best known, most innovative, greatest surgeons to ever come out of. They've all been published. They have come up with new procedures, and by golly, they save lives left and right. People come off of the surgical table healed and feeling great. And then you look to the second university, and you find that most of their graduates have been sued for malpractice. They tend to lose a lot of people on the surgical table. They're not well known. They're not published. They're not innovative. Which university do you want to go to? Obviously the first one. So when looking to find the true church, we have to ask this question. What does a healthy, healed, sanctified Christian look like? We have the answer already in the scriptures in the book of Acts. We see what happens to the apostles after the Holy Spirit descends upon them. We see how they act. We see the wonders they can work. We see how they think. We see how they approach problems. If the church is true, the Holy Spirit continues to pulse like blood through the church, then the church has to be living. And as I always say, the power that Christ has over sin, over the devil, and over the death, over death ought to be seen and present before us here and now and those who have been sanctified in that same spirit. We should find figures who look and act and speak and write and think like the apostles in every age of the church. So my challenge to anybody who's curious about orthodoxy, find the lives of the modern saints and elders. Read about St. Paisios. Read about St. Joseph the Hesychus. Read the book Father Arsene. Read about Elder Cleopa. Read about Father George Kautu. Read about Matryoshka Olga of Alaska. Read about these modern figures. And what you'll see is that the life of the Holy Apostles exists in the life of these modern saints. Read about St. Porphyrios. That's a good one. Read about St. Nectarius. What you're going to find is that the same spirit that illumined and guided the Apostles illumined and guided these modern saints of the Church. And we can see that the Church is healthy when she is producing saints. This is the key. This is the test of how our Church is doing. If your Church is not producing figures who look, speak, and act like the Holy Apostles, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. Either the church has become very unhealthy, or it's just simply not the true church. Again, it doesn't mean to say that you're not the true church isn't the criticism. It's funny, right? Protestants get mad. They say that's very triumphalistic to say that you're the one true church. My response is always, don't you say that the only way to heaven is through Christ? Yeah. Well, why isn't that triumphalistic? We're just saying that Christ established a church, and there's only one church that you can actually find throughout history that maintains the same doctrine and worship and hierarchy and results in the saints, and that's the Orthodox Church. It's not to cry you. It's not to criticize you. It's just to say that if you want the fullness of truth, this is where it is. So, resources. If you want to learn more about this, uh, I have quite a few books to, the, to recommend. 
Um, the first, um, which has been around for a long time, I think it's out of publication right now, but um, a lot of people uh, really like it and change their life. It's called The Way, What Every Protestant Should Know About the Orthodox Church. It's by Clark Carlton. Um, now, I will tell you, I found some people who read this and found it to be a little too polemical. Most people really enjoyed it. Clark Carlton was a Baptist who became Orthodox, talked about his experience, why he converted, and he says some really fascinating things there. One of the really amazing things he talks about is how if you look at the confessions of certain Protestant denominations from when they started, like Lutheranism, you'll see that they don't even agree with themselves today. So he says, if you, if they don't believe, if, if you don't believe what they believe then, how do you know what's believed in 50 years will be what you believe today? It's, it's a constantly moving train, you gotta watch out for that. The second is a book by someone called Matthew Gallatin, I actually knew him in Northern Idaho, it's called Thirsting for God in a Land of Shallow Wells. Uh, this is a, a little bit more of a philosophical look at the differences between orthodoxy and Protestantism. It goes about a little bit more philosophically. It's a good book. Again, I've had people who loved it and people who thought it was too polemical. So, uh, The third isn't directly about Protestantism. It's about orthodoxy, but it addresses a lot of Protestant um, criticisms of orthodoxy, and that's the book Know the Faith, K-N-O-W, Know the Faith, by Father Michael Chambor. He's a wonderful priest. Uh, the fourth is... A really interesting one. It's called Light from the Christian East. It's by James Payton Jr. Why is this one so interesting? James Payton Jr. is not Orthodox. He's Protestant, and he's a professor who teaches about Orthodoxy at a university. And he decided to take his courses and say, okay, what can we Protestants learn from the Orthodox? And he wrote a really nice book, by the way, that has the best chapter on grace that I've ever read, about what grace actually is from an Orthodox standpoint. It's really good. Okay, the next one, um, I have some reservations about this one which may surprise some people. I'm going to put this online, so I'll take the heat. But uh, it's The Orthodox Church by Metropolitan Callisto Swear. Um, the first half is fantastic for the most part. It just, it's just history. It goes to the whole history of the church. Very transformative, has converted a lot of people, really changed their lives. The second part on, part on doctrine, I really don't, I actually don't love this approach. So I recommend reading the first half. I don't necessarily recommend the second half. It's, it's not, it's like one of those things where he teaches it in a certain way that's going to be um, digestible to a Westerner, to a Western Christian. But as you learn more, you go, okay, it's not really this way. You know, he just puts it in, in the language that, that's more suitable to them. It's not my favorite, but for the history part, I think it's very good. For a, a history part from the, just the early church that shows that what happened in the early church from, the, from Acts to the first, I think, five centuries is the same church that we find in the Orthodox Church today is uh, David Ford's Wisdom for Today from the Early Church. Wisdom for today from the early church. Really, I mean, phenomenal. I love this book. Some people have read it and they thought it was a little boring. I didn't find it boring at all. I mean, he goes to Acts, the time of the apologists, the, the martyrs. I mean, just again and again, he shows this is the same thing as the Orthodox Church today. And his, his, his chapter on Acts is especially illuminating. And finally, the final one, uh, which is really a must, is Father Josiah Trenton's Rock and Sand. Rock and Sand will go through the entire Protestant Reformation and give Orthodox appraisal of the movement. And he's, he's very, very uh, even handed in the whole thing. It's a really wonderful book. So that's the final one I would recommend. Um, the, I'll, I'll just end by saying for anybody watching online who is a Protestant and is learning about Orthodoxy, uh, you kind of have to go through a process. I think a lot of you here have did this. You know, when you first enter an Orthodox church, it's good to do a little research, you know, look, go on YouTube, uh, look at what to expect. But a lot of people go in and the first reaction is, oh my goodness, <laughs> I gotta run. Just push yourself through, push yourself through. The second time through, you're going to look at this and go, okay, mm, I'm not really so sure about this, but is, this isn't really pushing against me too much. Like, maybe I'll give it a chance. And the third time you go, oh my goodness, I have a lot of questions, and I really want to learn. So go, go to liturgy. Go to liturgy at least three times. Speak with the priest. Do some reading, and take your time. Take your time. Orthodoxy is a lot. It's a lot to swallow, but it's a beautiful thing. One of the things you'll find is... Again, maybe a little polemical, forgive me if this is a little bit uh, critical, but with a lot of Protestantism today, it's like an inverse pyramid. The deeper you go, the less there is to take, care, take, take from, the less there is to, to take hold of and interchange. There's just not a lot of meat, and everything kind of doesn't go past a certain point. Orthodoxy is the opposite. It's a pyramid that the deeper you go, the more there is. And the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know anything. And that's how the expanse of God should be. God is this beautiful mystery, and rather than standing outside of him and trying to examine it, orthodoxy just shoves you right in the middle and says, experience it. Experience it. It can be tough at times, but it is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing, and this is one of the things that orthodoxy, I think, does better than anybody. 
it reveals the beauty of heaven and worship to us here and now. We're not reaching up to some distant heaven. Christ is bringing heaven down to us. And he's transforming us along the way. So may God bless you.